Welcome to Church Hurts and the good, the bad, and the ugly about church, religion, and spirituality with a dash of recovery thrown in. If you've ever had questions about the church, maybe a bit jaded in your attitude toward religion, well, you come to the right place. Our host, he was an honors philosophy student, ordained a Presbyterian minister, planted three churches, taught at a prestigious university, but now, now he's just an aging curmudgeon who never quits asking the question why. The host of Church Hurts and Dr. John Bass. What a great swinger you are. You are such a great swinger. I was editing some old videos as a favor to a friend, enjoying see her on film decades before. And uh, oh, she was with her firstborn <laughs> child. Sure. And I watched, captured by the constant string of af affirmations given to this young girl for anything she did right down for the way she was swinging on a swing. It was hard not to ponder what such encouragements would do for this little person's psychological health. What I would have given to have had a mother half this supportive. What about you? How well have you done in life? What grade would you give yourself? Have you noticed that people around you have widely different standards when they self-evaluate? It's easy to look at those we have bested and say, compared to them, I've done pretty well. But such wasn't my tendency. I look at those around me who've accomplished much more than I have and fight with discouragement. At Church Hurts and we're well aware that the pain attributed to churches is often connected to the expectation which one has of church leaders. Who doesn't have a story of disappointment at the hands of church leaders who seem capable, uniquely capable, of missing the point or insensitively squandering an opportunity for healing and growth. Today, we're going to talk about those leaders and how they do with self-evaluation. You might be surprised to hear about those you often see with a microphone in hand and spotlights bright on their leadership positions. Do you think they give affirmation or get affirmation given to them? Maybe did they get it from like the mom gave to the child? Good swinging, great sermon, excellent leadership. Thank you, Pastor. Our show today is entitled Longevity, Failure, and Power. And our guest is more than well qualified to speak on this subject. With many degrees and many pastorates under his belt, we welcome Dr. Ken Eichler currently the Executive Director for the Center of Pastoral Well-Being and Longevity at Standing Stone Ministry. Welcome, Ken, to Church Hurts and. Hey, thanks, John. It's such a privilege and a pleasure to be here with you. You know, Ken, um, I'd like, you know, I started here by talking about an affirming mother. Let's just dive in. Could you tell maybe an exact opposite story when it comes to your father? Would you tell us a little bit about your family? Sure. Uh, my father um, grew up in a what you would think is a blue-collar worker environment uh, with his mom and dad, but uh, his personality was wired in such a way that he was often considered very friendly and engaging, but he didn't know how to build a significant relationship with the people that he was involved in. Of course, that comes right into the family unit, you know, when with my mother and then with my two older brothers and two younger sisters. So even though people would think of him as being very friendly, he didn't know how to build a relationship with his kids. And I found uh, that when I was nine years old, my father, who was a salesperson at that time, fell into a tremendous sales slump and found uh, a, a time of, of um, solitude in reading, reading science fiction books. Well, you can't sell very many things when you are laying on the couch and reading science fiction books. So uh, even though the, the books he was going through were being finished, 
the bills were not being paid. And so when I was nine years old, my father went and committed armed robbery at a movie theater in Oklahoma City. He robbed a theater of $54, and that $54 cost him over three years in the state penitentiary. Man, for how does that feel to a nine-year-old boy? Well, what happened was, you know, we were thrown into uh, a welfare environment. I remember going into with my mother and my brothers and sisters to a warehouse in a part of Oklahoma City. Uh, they roll back the 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 panel, the <laughs> the door, and give us a cardboard box, and then they'd put in that box. Uh, a bag of rice, a bag of, of beans, uh, powdered milk, powdered eggs, and something that they thought looked kind of like Velveeta cheese, but it was a processed cheese that uh, was actually probably better than anything in that box. But I remember, John, people coming down the street and they would see the poor people lined up getting these, uh, these boxes and, um, and just walking around us and going to the other side of the street to get by us as if we were like piranha. Mm -hmm. So it was very difficult. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you one of the, the main things that was so painful and difficult was when we were at our school, elementary school, we were separated into two different lines, lunch lines. There was the line for the kids who could pay. And then there was the line for the kids that were poor. And I remember my peers looking at me and laughing and mocking us because we didn't have money to buy our own lunches. Mm. Now, this is OC Talk Radio, and we're um, talking about Oklahoma City. Somewhere between that line waiting for food to the 70s, you ended up at Melody Land in was it Anaheim or your Belinda? No, it's Anaheim. Yeah. Anaheim um, headed into the ministry. What happened to you? Well, uh, one of the things was that when I uh, sold everything I had, because I was living at that time in Little Rock, Arkansas, and uh, loaded up my VW Beetle and headed out to uh, Melodyland School of Theology to complete my bachelor's degree in ministry. Uh, I felt inside, a lot of my friends were telling me, Ken, what are you doing? You have no money. How are you going to exist? How are you going to pay for uh, any of the bills that you're going to be facing? And I just said, well, I think God's going to take care of me, but... If he doesn't do it, I'm sharp enough to take care of myself. Uh, well, uh, when I got to, to the school and to Anaheim, I found out I wasn't so sharp to take care of myself. And I'll, I'll never forget that I, I believe that uh, God was trying to do something in my life to say, keep your eyes looking up. Don't put your confidence in people. Don't, and certainly don't put your confidence and trust in yourself because you're not that sharp, Ken. Well, now you have an impressive resume and I'm not going to go down it, but would you just brag for a minute before I, you know, pick your brain for your wisdom, because you have some credentials to speak on this subject. Um, where'd you get, where'd you go? You got, you got your ministry degree and what'd you do? Well, um, I have been pastoring for 46 years. And uh, my master's degree was in theology at Fuller uh, Seminary there in Pasadena, California. And my doctorate is in marriage and family counseling from Denver Seminary in Colorado. And so you think I've, I've planted three churches. I've been uh, in the largest churches in the United States and some of the very smallest churches in the United States. I've been a lead pastor executive pastor. I've been a youth pastor, an associate pastor. I've cleaned toilets. I've done it all, John, in, in the church. And uh, now I find myself at this stage in, of my life in caring for uh, pastoral leaders, ministry leaders, and their spouses around the country and in 30 plus nations. 
Now, now you qualified yourself for church. Yeah. But I mean, your church is a gaps. I mean, you're just one of those straight guys. Huh? What do you think about church hurts? Does church hurts? It seems like it's a great thing for you there. Uh, church hurts uh, <laughs> because they're full of hurting people. And I've come to understand, John, hurting people hurt other people. And it doesn't matter whether you're a pastor, you're going to be hurt. And it doesn't matter if you're a pastor caring for other people, you're going to hurt them because we're all broken people. Mm. And, you know, our title is Longevity, Failure, and Power. Let's just talk about failure for a minute. Uh, because we tend not to look at the doubting side um, of people who are, you know, in front of the camera, who... In this case, we think of mega churches. Somebody will see a preacher up front with a microphone. You know, remember when I first um, got started to speak to four or five thousand people? I thought it was going to be so hard and it was so easy because you kind I kind of got a break. You know, it's like if I my joke would normally fail, at least there some would get it. And it would start to ripple across. It was, but people would see me as you know they can't really talk to them. There's too many people. Let's talk about the other side of that. Talk about the failure. What's the perception of most clergy when it comes to how they're doing? Yeah, well, first, John, I, you know, I think it's important to understand that all of us were created as a whiteboard. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to have erasable ink on us. But through the experiences of life uh, with our parents, siblings, uh, as, we've, as we've grown up, we have had people and experiences and very painful experiences that have been written on us with permanent ink. Mm -hmm. And because it, get, and it gets very confusing as we go into our marriages or uh, as a pastor going into a, a church environment filled with, with people, with, with thoughts, ideas, perceptions, opinions, and, uh, and they want to do some writing. They want to, uh, to define who you are. You're trying to come, uh, come and erase some of those things that you have felt defined you when you were a child. I'll never forget uh, being in that lunch line, John, when I said to myself, I don't need you. I don't belong in this line. And I'll show you who can take care of themselves. Okay. Well, that is what that did is that set me up to try to be self-sufficient in all things, thinking that I don't need anybody in my life to help me to help um, in, in any of my relationships, my family relationships, uh, because I'm going to be self-sufficient. And I came to understand John that I wasn't, that I was a needy person like anybody else. And as I deal with ministry leaders around the country and I see their whiteboards as they open up, if I could say the kimono, and uh, as they share with me the, the depths of their experiences, their hurts, their failures, their fears, uh, I, I've come to see how their experiences have written certain things on their lives and have tried to cause a narrative about them that maybe isn't truthful. So people who spend their lives giving to others, hopefully in the best possible way, preachers, ministers, priests, whatever, whatever names they get, Underneath, often those insecurities are actually brought to the surface because of their leadership, isn't it? It absolutely is, John. In fact, because I don't know too many people that are in a position where every word that comes out of their mouth is judged and often criticized. Everything they do, every action is judged and criticized. You look at people's clothes, people judge their clothing, the car they drive, the movie they go see, the books they read, the friends maybe they have. And then all of a sudden you have somebody that's always looking at you. You're truly in a fishbowl that 24 seven. And uh, again, we try to uh, align 
the narrative, that self-narrative that we have to people's narratives, to maybe our spiritual enemy's narrative about us, and certainly with God's narrative about us, and often it doesn't line up, and there's confusion, and there's discouragement, and there's pain, doubt, and yet we're supposed to put on this facade of, hey, everything's good, I'm happy, my family's happy, let me tell you how you can be happy. And when we're all trying to discover authentic life in, uh, in for me, in Christ Jesus. So, so let me put you in another line. Okay. Now the line you've just spoken in church to hundreds, thousands of people. And at the back, you have to stand there and shake hands. <laughs> and people are thinking, you know, everybody's just there and they're there to shake your hand. Now, what are you thinking? What's going to happen as you sit there and shake hands afterwards? What are you, what are you waiting for? Yeah. Well, oftentimes, uh, some shake your hands and some as they're shaking your hand, they lean into you and say, wow, uh, you, you missed it on that one point, pastor. Or, <laughs> oh, you know, we need to have a talk because I think your doctrine's a little messed up here. Or the whispers they have, you know, gosh, I wish you could walk what you talk sometimes, Pastor. Mm -hmm. Or, hey, this is too, too much fluff. This isn't enough meat for me or whatever it might be. And as a person whose primary love language, if you're familiar with the five love language, Gary Chapman's sure. book, and my primary love language is words of affirmation. So you tell me I'm doing a good job. You tell me that I've done something that has pleased you. Oh, that makes me feel loved by you. And 98% of the people just gave you that. You go home that afternoon. What do you remember? Well, I remember, <laughs> I'll tell you what I remember. It's the negative stuff that was said, but I was my worst critic. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, you should have done better. Oh, Ken, you could have said this and you use this particular word or you didn't use the right tense or, you know, I mean, I was raised in Oklahoma and Arkansas. And let me tell you, I think I was, um, uh, I missed a lot of the quality teaching in the area of English. So, you know, I know English is my first language, but I struggle with that. I don't care how many degrees I have. There are certain things when we are children, habits that we fall into. And, um, and so uh, anyway, so I beat myself up. And then there's, like I said, John, there's a spiritual enemy that wants to beat me up too. And then the one that I love the most, my wife might make a comment or two and I go, Oh, oh no. Oh, that hurts. <laughs> that hurts. This is a wife who likes horses and cows and <laughs> all that stuff. Yeah, she's a chicken lover. My wife's a chicken lover. So uh no, she she tells people, I like people, but I love animals because she's found out that animals don't really hurt her like people mm. do. And she's defensive of her husband, who she's seen get hurt, who yeah. now is helping others. But I'm going to, I want to take a break here. Okay. Because I'm, I've been thinking, and people ask me all the time, um, explain again what you do. And I really haven't talked. We've done over 30 shows on Church Hurts End, and I haven't talked about Standing Stone. Um, for those of you who don't know, I do what Ken does. He, he is, he's refining himself. But in fact, um, the first time you were the first line of qualification, we had to talk. And part of our talk was you said, but we kind of have a missionary model where you're going to be supported by people who've benefited from your ministry and who believe in what you're going to be doing, helping others in ministry. And you said, it's not going to be that bad. So I was thinking, I need to somehow tell people that that's how I supported my day job. Um, you know, I need support. How do I do that and not turn off the part of our audience? Because we have a general audience. This isn't a Christian radio show. Um, how do you say, you know, would you like to be part of that and not offend people? You said it wouldn't be hard. I find it really hard. <laughs> <laughs> well, John, I, first of all, I uh, have come to understand that if this is something that God has called me to do, then he's going to provide for me and my family. And what I need to do is be a messenger. 
Uh, the people that are on my partnership support team, they know me. The vast majority of them know me because I've married them. I have buried their family members. I've been in the hospitals with them when they've gone through accidents. I've done marriage counseling with them. I have, I have been uh, tried to be a servant to them in all of what I do and in their life. And they know that I care and love for them. John, you're a loving man. You have got a wonderful track record behind you too. And because you have a radio show, a podcast uh, show, a lot of people might not know you personally, but here's the thing. Here's where God, I believe, connects the hearts of people to our hearts. People aren't stupid, man. You're your, um, um, uh, those that listen to you, whether radio or your podcast, they can tell whether you're being authentic or not. And John, you're the real deal. And I would just continue to say, tell your stories, tell people what you're doing. Of course, Stanny Stone, our main thing is confidentiality. It's not, <laughs> you know, we're not going to tell people who we care for. If your audience knew some of the ministry leaders that I care for that are national and international leaders, they would be shocked to know that, but I'm going to care. I'll take those to my grave. They're not, people aren't going to know who I care for, but here's the thing is if, if you said, go and ask God, if you want to help partner with me to do something with what he has entrusted into their care as stewards, then if God puts that on their heart and they send you uh, financial support so you can get out here, John, and by the way, we need you more, my friend. There is such a need out there, but here's the thing. God's going to do that, and so I would encourage your listeners, uh, go on to standingstoneministry.org and find John's picture, his cute picture up there, and click on that. It'll give you a link to know how to to uh, partner with him to care for our ministry leaders. I have as large a church as, as I have served in the past, I have in an indirect way, I'm pastoring hundreds of thousands of people because of the influence of care and love and encouragement that I have with their pastors. And it's amazing, so, amazing so way to just, spend life. Yeah. Um, and I can just say, yeah, I'll make it even easier. Go to churchhurtsand.org. I always forget to mention that. As well as if you're listening on uh, on YouTube, if you'd hit the subscribe button, and if you listen to my podcast, do the same thing and, and write a little note in there. People uh, like to look and see what you think before they even listen. But, you know, Ken, you're while we do the same thing, you have a different job title than I do. I'm a shepherd. I, I deal directly with pastors and um, as you have, but now you're getting into this new center talking about longevity. In other words, we've talked a lot about the pain and the downside and the hurt. And part of that means that it is hard to hang in there, um, to have longevity. I think you're talking about more than just life. You're talking about ending up being a faithful person, not a bitter, angry one, right? Yes, that's exactly right. In fact, you know, at Standing Stone, our mission is to care for ministry leaders and their spouses and make sure they're as healthy as they possibly can be, whether it's physically, emotionally, mentally, uh, uh, spiritually, in every area. We want them to be healthy and strong. And then we want them to last in their ministry assignments. I mean, we have a rash, a, 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 a large number of ministry leaders that leave the ministry prematurely because of their hurts and pains and because they have no one safe, John, confidential that they can go and share those struggles and issues and pain with because people are out to judge them. And so uh, we, you know, if, if, church board members find out a pastor struggling in an area that it's easier for them to just get rid of them and find another pastor to come in. And so these wonderful heroes of the church 
uh, stuff their, their problems, their issues, their pressures until it comes out in very uh, gross and ugly ways. And, and if, so if, we're out to do that. We're out to keep them in ministry in a healthy way, in a, in a longer uh, way. So, and, and if our listeners know um, a pastor who maybe they've gotten a hint that they're hurting um, or even they want to do something for them, same thing. They can just call Standing Stone and ask um, to have a shepherd who would just encourage them or maybe even to get away on a retreat with their wife. Uh, all those kind of things, right? Yeah, John, it's interesting because we had a, a, a pastor of a very large church here in Arkansas that uh, uh, sent a request in through our website, and one of our administrative team members n- noticed that the area code was the area code that I lived in. And mm-hmm. so I called up uh, that pastor and he was shocked that, first of all, one of the leaders, and I'd been the director of ministry for Standing Stone for a number of years before we're establishing our research and strategy center that you, that you talk about. But anyway, went over to be with him. He was shocked. You know, I told him what we could do to come along and help him and his, his wife, his staff, their spouses, and even work with their uh, church leadership. Uh, on board members. And he he said, okay, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. What's your sales pitch? And I go, Mm -hmm. what do you mean? He says, well, how much is this going to cost me? I said, oh, this doesn't cost you $1. It doesn't cost your church a dollar. It doesn't cost your denomination $1. We do this because there's people who love you and need you to be healthy that have come on our ministry support teams. And they say to me, Ken, they say to you, John Bash, you go out and you care for these ministry leaders. And that's what we get the the pleasure and privilege to do. So he was shocked. He was so amazed. He says, will you come to my church and I'm going to actually be there for, to meet with his whole staff and begin a relationship with his staff to care for his whole team. You know, I got one more question and we got to go, but I'm going to appeal to the mutt in you. And I I call you a mutt because, (laughs) you know, you, you've just kind of, you've worked with different denominations. And, and I remember when I went to Fuller for my doctorate and I looked around and they talk about mutts. I mean, they had, you know, Episcopalians and Baptists and fundamentalists and, you know, Lutherans, everything. And as I looked around the class, what struck me was that we all had the same problems, even though our theologies and our church styles and everything were really different. And I, you know, what really, I think some people think, well, it's different for my priest or it's different for my guy because we're this kind of a church. Are the issues really very different from denomination to denomination when it comes to pastoral health? Absolutely not, John. We all put on the same pair of pants, socks, underwear, and, uh, and we have problems, we have issues. We have brought our family of origins into our ministry. We have unique uh, relationships, marital relationships, family dynamics that all play into uh, what we do. And uh, there is no difference there. We, there. We're broken people that are hurting, that, that are keep hopefully keeping our eyes looking upward, saying, God, I need help, help me. And to have the confidence to know that the, our creator, the one who loves every person that's listening to my voice right now, who, who has intrinsic value with your creator, says, I'm here to help you keep your eyes looking up to me. And so uh, we're just messengers, John. We want to try to do our part, but hopefully they'll come to understand the great love of our God. Mm. Well, I'm going to wrap up kind of remembering, we think, you know, different denominations are different and, and pastors are different than regular people. And we kind of all come down to, you know what, Ken, just so thankful for you. But as I wrap up, Andy, is in the hospital today. He's 84, seemingly in excellent health, but a mass was discovered next to his brain. 
For a week, they've been poking and prodding and trying to figure out what to do. I got word from his family, and uh, he told me that, uh, or they told me, he was asking that uh, I pray and I know what's going on. And I have been. But as I've been praying, I've also been wondering, how's he processing this? As we've been talking about measurements and assessments in the context of ministry today, I've been thinking about the Apostle Paul's self-assessment of his life when he was on the verge of death. Paul was stuck in a dark and damp prison cell in Rome during the reign of the wicked and insane Emperor Nero, who tried to make Christians the scapegoats for his own failings. It wasn't a pretty picture for Nero, for Rome, or for Paul. Before Paul concludes a letter to his faithful protege, Timothy, a letter we know as 2 Timothy in the New Testament, he pens these words, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now, I could go on and talk about what a great attitude the apostle to the Gentiles had sitting there in prison, but this is church hurts and let's get on us. What else did he say? Come quickly, because Demas deserted me because he loved the world. Crescens left for Galatia, and Titus to Dalmatia, Alexander the metal worker, he did me a great deal of harm. Harm. Ministry is hard work. Disappointments are abundant. But so is the Christian faith itself. If ever the adage, I didn't promise you a rose garden applied, it would be of Christianity. It is real. It's a fight a race. It's a struggle with a fantastic destination. So I got word about Andy the other day. The doctors still don't know, but Andy knew his family and others would be worried. So the word got passed around. Andy is okay with this. If it's his time, he's lived a full and rewarding life. He's comfortable with letting God number his days. If you face struggles today, I hope they may be softened a bit by knowing that it's part of the nature of life. It's not a sprint. It's not a punch. It's a race. It's a fight. May you keep the faith knowing you are not alone. Longevity matters. It's worth a thought. For Church Arts and this is John Bash. Enjoy God today, won't you? Well, that was worth a thought for sure. And brings us to the end of this edition of Church Hurts and. Next week, it's rumored we'll be walking on the edge of controversy, stirring the pot of denial, and finding movement of the divine. Our host, Dr. John Bash, is a shepherd with Standing Stone, a nonprofit ministry committed to caring for pastors and Christian leaders at risk of leaving the ministry prematurely. Come visit us at churchfirstand.org. Tell us your story while you're there. Until then, remember, church hurts isn't the end of the story. Now go into the end and enjoy God today, won't you?